Is it right for a church to disfellowship a person because of their sin? Find out what the Scriptures teach next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Evangelist Kevin Presley. It's great to have this time with you today to study the Bible, and in particular, to give the Bible a fair hearing on what has become a highly controversial subject. What does the Bible teach about church discipline? Is it appropriate for a congregation to withdraw its fellowship from a person because of sin or immorality? Does the church have any responsibility in judging and correcting an unrepentant, sinning brother or sister? In recent years, we've heard of church splits and even lawsuits being filed, claims of discrimination being hurled because of church discipline being carried out. Well, God demands that His people live holy lives, Hebrews 12 and verse 14. And Paul ordered the church in Ephesians 5 verse 1 saying, But fornication on all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. But does the Bible tell us what to do in the case of a brother or sister who lives in sin and will not repent? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul addressed a toxic situation that existed in the church at Corinth. This church was established with people who came from a particularly lewd and licentious background, but in their conversion to Christ, that was to all be left behind. Unfortunately, though, the influence of the culture around them and their own past as sinners came back to haunt them, even as Christians. In particular, there was a man who was living in sexual immorality. He, first of all, was committing fornication and with his stepmother at that. And it appears the church was aware of his sin and was remaining silent at the least about it. So Paul addresses the matter and tells them how it was to be dealt with in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. There he says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What does he instruct the church to do about this man, and why? And how should churches today react to sin and immorality in their own ranks? Well, we'll study that in a moment. The psalmist said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man, and you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word, and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course? It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV.
Joshua, the leader of ancient Israel, simply could not understand. After their 13th march around the walls of Jericho, the walls had fallen, the city was burned with fire, it was a great victory, and Joshua was being hailed a hero throughout the land. It had been a stunning victory against a powerful, fortified foe. But now, Joshua has suffered a stunning defeat. Thirty-six of his men now lay dead outside the small, vulnerable city of Ai. He had even sent men up to Ai before the attack to assess the situation, and those men came back and told Joshua, why, we won't even need a full army to attack that little town. There's only a few of them. Just send up a small force, and we can take care of Ai in short order. But now 36 of Joshua's men had immediately died when they were chased away from the gates of that little insignificant city. Well, Joshua couldn't understand it. He was distraught. He asked God, how could this be? Why mighty Jericho, but not tiny Ai? Well, here's what God answered him in Joshua chapter 7, beginning in verse 10. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. And therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. God says you lost the battle at Ai because there was sin in the camp. You see, after Jericho fell, one of Joshua's men disobeyed God's orders. God said the treasures of that city belonged to him, and if any of them took it for themselves, they would suffer his wrath. But there was a covetous man by the name of Achan who tiptoed through the city, hiding the gold and silver beneath his garment. He snuck it back to the camp and buried it beneath his tent. And the people may not have known it, but God did. And the record says in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 1 that the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing, for Achan took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now that's an interesting verse and it's an interesting incident. We learn a few things from it. First of all, that the camp of God's people is to remain holy. God will not tolerate sin that is not repented of in the midst of His people. Second of all, other people suffer as a result of the sin of one person. Here 36 people died plus Achan and his own family as a result of this one man's sin. And third, others can even be culpable for the sin of another. Remember, the Bible says that the children of Israel committed a trespass, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel, even though it was Achan who actually committed the sin. Now, later, speaking of the experiences of ancient Israel, the Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 6, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And then in verse 11 he says, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Well, like Israel of old, the Corinthian church had sin in the camp. There was a particularly grievous situation there that at the very least the church had shown indifference to a man living in fornication. In fact, he was committing fornication with his stepmother. It was so scandalous, it was so shocking that Paul says it was not even named among the pagan people. He writes in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, I want to ask you, how do you suppose that scenario would be met in many churches today? Wouldn't we expect to hear things like, well, you know, that's really his and her business and none of ours? Or uh, likely some would say, well, you know, it's not up to us to judge. Only God can be their judge. Or uh, some might say, well, it's two consenting adults. Who are we to tell them what they can and cannot do? Or perhaps someone would say, well, Jesus forgave the adulterous woman that the Pharisees brought to Him. We, we shouldn't be like the Pharisees. Um, 
We should just love them. And maybe they'll see and everything will work out. You know, after all, Jesus ate with publicans and sinners. So let's not do anything that is very uh, radical in regard to this situation. That's not very hard to imagine those reactions because, in fact, that's what we usually hear when a person is living in sin and some person or some church says something about it. In fact, unfortunately, the church has been bullied into silence and complicity today. But friend, what matters is not what you or I say, think, or feel. And I know feeling reigns supreme in our postmodern age today, but that, that doesn't matter. Uh, the United States Constitution doesn't have any authority in this matter. The ACLU or any other so-called rights advocacy groups, they, they don't have any say in this issue as it pertains to the kingdom of God. King Jesus and His ambassadors, the apostles, they are the authorities in kingdom matters. And I want us to carefully read what Paul, speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and acting by the authority of the Lord Jesus, said in response to this man living in sin. He first says that the church to its shame was tolerating that sin. Uh, look at verse 2. He says, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned. In other words, they knew this man was living in sin, but they saw no need to correct him. They thought everything was okay. But Paul said instead of glorying in the man, they should rather mourn or grieve over him. Some speculate that the man was a wealthy or influential man among their number. But if that be the case, it made no difference to Paul. The man should have been ashamed of how he was living, and the church should have been grieved over the fact that this man was living in sin and was going to be lost if he didn't repent. You, you see, that's really the bottom line. So now look at verses 3 through 5. He says, For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, or by his authority, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now first, Paul says the prescribed action was in the name or by the authority of Jesus Himself. Get that now. By Christ's authority, the church there at Corinth was to gather together and deliver this offender over to Satan so that, he says, his flesh might be destroyed. That is, that he'll learn that the sin of the flesh must cease if he wants to be saved. And thus, his spirit can be saved in judgment. Now we'll see what that means in a moment, but first, what does Paul mean by delivering him over to Satan? Was this some physical act or punishment? Uh, were they to take his life and let him go to hell? No, not at all. That's not what Paul is saying at all. Rather, they were to turn him out of the kingdom of light back over to Satan's domain, the world. Now, in other words, there are only two spiritual domains. Only two. There's the church and there's the world. And uh, every accountable human being is, is in, every human being is in one of those two kingdoms. Every human being is either, either in the church or in the world. You're not in both. You're not in neither. You're either in the church or you're in the world. And the kingdom of Christ, which is the church of Christ, and the kingdom of Satan, which is the world with its sin and darkness, those are two opposing kingdoms. And to be excluded from one means to be a part of the other. And so Paul is simply instructing them that they are to remove him from their fellowship. And he explains how they are to do so in verse 11. He says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother, that is a Christian, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. In other words, they were not to have any corporate or social fellowship or dealings with this man until he repented of his sin. They were not to interact with him and treat him as though everything is okay. They weren't to share the Lord's table or any other table with him because he was to them to be an outcast. Why? Was it to be mean? Uh, was it an act of vengeful spite or punishment? 
Uh, was it to make other members of the church feel superior to the man and to somehow put him down? No. And if church discipline is carried out as a result of such motives today, friend, that's not discipline, that's hypocrisy and injustice and cruelty. Uh, but rather, what Paul is talking about is legitimate scriptural discipline of God's children. I, I was searching for some images in regard to this topic, and this one happened to come up. And you know, unfortunately, right there is the image that a lot of people have when you mention something like church discipline. And, and friend, if that is the image that is conjured up in your mind when we talk about church discipline, uh, you very well are misunder you may be misunderstanding what the Apostle Paul is teaching. Paul is instructing the church here not to so much punish the man, but to admonish and correct him. How? Well, by demonstrating the fact that he has no fellowship with God while he lives in his sin. And they demonstrate that by the fact that he no longer has fellowship with God's people. You see, fellowship exists in a relational triangle. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Listen now, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. Now you see, in order for two people to scripturally and truly be in fellowship, both people must have fellowship with God. And if two people are in fellowship with God, then that by default means they are to be in fellowship with each other. But if fellowship is broken between a person and God, then it is as well to be broken between that sinning person and the other person who remains in fellowship with God. Fellowship is a triangle, therefore. So the action that Paul commands in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is really an outward demonstration of the state of this man's fellowship with God. In other words, the action was designed to make this man see the reality and the gravity of his sin and to cause him to repent. Now, remember, the church should have been mourning over this man's sin. How could they do so and not urge him to turn away from his sin? We're not grieved over a man's sin if we simply go along as though sin is no problem and we allow a man without admonishment, without correction to continue in his sinful way that will cause him to be lost. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Paul says, you withdraw yourself from the disorderly brother. So this delivering one over to Satan that Paul commands means to withdraw the church's fellowship from the sinning brother or sister. They are not to have spiritual and social intercourse with him. They are merely to uh, uh, admonish him to repent of his sin, and that's as far as it goes. You see, it is an act of discipline. And what seems so ironic to many is it's really an act of love and concern. You say, well, I don't look at it that way. Uh, it's really uh, uh, hateful to discipline a brother or sister in Christ. Well, let me ask you this. Do you love your children? Do you discipline them? Is that discipline pleasant? Is it sometimes even painful to you both? Do you administer it to be mean or cruel or to get revenge on your child? Why, of course not. If so, that's not discipline, that's child abuse. Let me ask you another question. Does God love His children? Does God love His children? The Bible says God is love. And the Bible also says that God chastens His children according to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. I believe God does that through the trials that He allows to enter into our life that refine us and mold us and make us to be what He wants them to be us to be, just like discipline shapes and molds a child, whether it be instructive or corrective. Discipline molds a child into what a parent uh, envisions him to become. Yeah, well, the apostle said in Hebrews 12 and 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, 
and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And in verse 11 he says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. In other words, he's saying discipline is for our good. And Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5 that we deliver this unrepentant, sinning brother over to Satan in order to provoke and produce repentance. And in fact, it did exactly what it was intended to do because when Paul wrote back to the church in 2 Corinthians, he acknowledged that that man had repented of his sin and was to be restored to the fellowship of the church. But then Paul cites another reason for withdrawing from this man, saying in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Now, glory, glorying here doesn't necessarily mean that they were going around just boasting about the man's sin, but rather they were overlooking it, considering themselves to be a sound and healthy and thriving church, perhaps with an appeal to the world. Paul said, oh no, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know, sin is often compared to leaven or yeast in the Bible, and Paul is saying that if it's left unnoticed, unwarned, and uncorrected, that sin, like leaven, not only destroys the soul of the one who remains in it, but it also has a contagion about it. It spreads. Sin is like a cancer, and either you get the cancer or the cancer gets you. In other words, if this man were allowed to continue in his sin, unrebuked, unchallenged, undisciplined, it would for one thing embolden others to live in sin. And perhaps as was the case of the ancient Israelites in the book of Joshua that we read about a few moments ago, kindle the wrath of God toward the congregation. My friends, God will not bless those who cling to sin. It's as simple as that. God's blessing will not rest upon a church that does not desire and strive to be a holy church. God will not bless a church that overlooks and harbors, and even if by nothing else than ignoring it, encourages sin. So friend, it's not a pleasant thing. It's a, it's a heartbreaking thing. It, it is a terrible thing to have to administer. But church discipline is a scriptural and it is a necessary thing if people are going to be saved. And it is a very serious thing. And the apostle makes that very plain here within this text. Now, what does this mean in regard to how we look at people who are in the world and not members of the church? Are we to have the same disposition toward people in the world who live in an immoral fashion? What are the sins that the Bible say warrant church discipline being enacted? What are we to do and how are we to carry out this disciplinary action when a brother refuses to repent of sin? And what about those who argue that church discipline is unloving and contrary to the spirit and even the actual teaching of Jesus himself? What about the parable of the weed and the tares? Didn't Jesus teach that we're to coexist with sinners until the end of time and just let him judge? Well, all of those are very valid questions, and we're going to take them up. You won't want to miss the rest of our study next week. In the meantime, I'll be back in a moment. But first, a song.
The Apostle Paul saw the gospel as a sacred trust, saying in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 5 that he didn't use flattering words nor a cloak of covetousness. But yet preachers week after week come into our living rooms with their handout. We don't expect you to fund our ministry or to pay to hear the gospel. Therefore, Let the Bible Speak is different. This program is brought to you by a local congregation of the Church of Christ in your community who simply want to reach out and spread the truth of New Testament Christianity. We thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak, and we hope that you'll tell someone else about this program and encourage them to see the difference. Want to see today's study again? Watch Let the Bible Speak anytime, even on the go, on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Go to letthebiblespeak.tv and also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Our time is about gone today. Don't forget, next week, Lord willing, we will take up part two of this study on church discipline. We'll talk about some of the misunderstood aspects of this very important Bible doctrine. So I hope you'll plan to join me for that and tell others about it in the meantime. If you would like a transcript of what we've studied today, it's always free of cost. That's the case with anything we ever offer here on Let the Bible Speak. Uh, just simply ask for it. You can write to us or email us. You can get in touch with us through social media and ask for the lesson Church Discipline and it will be on its way. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, by the way. Just search for LTBS TV on any of the social media platforms and you'll find us. Be sure to follow, like, subscribe to our social media accounts. And uh, also want to encourage you to subscribe to, on iTunes to our podcast and you'll get the program each week. You can download it right to your phone or your iPod, your device, and listen to it on the go. We appreciate you for being with us here today on the program. And Lord willing, I'll plan to meet you back here next time for our continuation of this study of the Word of God. Until then, I do hope that you have a wonderful week and may God bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ. Bible.